families. So it would be tough to find anyone in the college market who has changed more lives than Dell Suggs. His leadership and higher education programs emphasize personal leadership skills, organizational techniques, and interpersonal skills in ways that truly empower student leaders. Dell is a genuine life hacker and teaches students to maximize their leadership skills while introducing the technology they love. Dell Suggs was named one of the five top performers of the last 25 years by Campus Activities Magazine, an honor reflecting his stellar career in this field. Dell was the highest rated speaker in the Campus Activities Magazine Artist Reports card and was voted best campus speaker by the school members of the Association for the Promotion of Campus Activities. And he may be the only person you know who actually votes on the Grammy Awards. Dell has the perfect combination of skills and experience for leadership development. He has spent much of his career as an entertainer. He has the academic credentials of a professor and he has a lifetime of experience as a leader of national, regional and local organizations. He has presented at over 850 campuses from Seattle to Fort Lauderdale, from Hartford to Laredo, and most points in between. He is thrilled to be presenting at Indiana University Southeast today. So please help me welcome Del Suggs. Thank you, Grace. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, very, you're very, you're very kind. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to to, to be a, uh, making a presentation for you today, and and excited. I throw in a thank thank Seth really for inviting me here to, to 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 join you. I wish I could be there in person, but we always say that because you know we're all. Uh, we're all facing quarantine fatigue and we'd all like to travel and, and see our friends. And uh, I'm very hug deprived at this point. You know, I have a lot of people that I'd love to hug that I haven't been able to. So, but we'll get back to that. We'll come to that. So this is what I want to do. Just kind of get us started. I'm going to ask you a couple of, a couple of questions right out front. Uh, do you all have your chat turned on? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions here and then I'm going to ask you to respond via chat. And if you have an interesting answer, well then we'll probably, um, ask you to uh, to share that with us. Maybe explain it to us. Okay, you see the first question? If a movie was made about your life, what would, would it be titled? Nice, Hazley. Crazy family. I like that. Yeah. Secret life of coal. Ah. Coming to Men America. How to put out fires and survive. Leanne sounds like a champion. That's that's my job. That's my job. As a volunteer leader, you spend most of your time putting out fires. You know, if you've ever had a leadership role, and I'm sure you all have, you realize that, you know, mostly what you do is problem solve. Esther the musical. I like that. That's great. That's great. The stressful adventures of grace. Nice. Nice. Okay, did we hear from everyone? Michelle? Just a Midwest girl, there you go. That's the song, right? Okay, let me give you another one here. Give me another one. What was the worst purchase you ever made? Think about that. We all have those things we buy, those, you know, we have that buyer's remorse afterwards. Sometimes it's something simple like a pair of shoes that you thought would fit and they never fit right. Or sometimes it's like a 2001 Dodge Neon or something that you bought, you know. That, that car you thought you were gonna rebuild and it was gonna be fabulous when it was finished, but it never was. Or that 
that coat that you thought looked fabulous in the store, but then you got home and you just, it just always looked terrible every time you wore it, both times you wore it. A backpack made from a flannel shirt. Yeah, that sounds like a bad idea. Yeah. Transmissions are pretty important though, Grace. Right? Saying. Ah, oh, Chevy Colorado, there you go. Slimming bathing suit, yeah. Oh, food from Taco Bell. Just about anything from Taco Bell, you know, it's good, could kind of fall in that category. Oh, that's great. That's great. You guys are awesome. That's wonderful. Well, I had hoped to share some videos with you today, but we've having some trouble with the streaming, making the streaming happen. So I've got one I'm going to share with you later, but I'm going to start off with the uh, with, with, with this, because I think this is really, really important. This is a, a scene from the, um, the running of the bulls in Pamplona. And this is kind of the theme of what this whole program is about. Tradition, just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it's not incredibly stupid. You know, we do this a lot with our clubs and organizations. Uh, it's just something that we sort of stumble into because a lot of us end up in clubs that have been run badly and we didn't realize they were being run badly because it's all we knew. Or we are going to end up being in charge of a club or organization and we didn't realize that things could be done differently or done better. So that's the purpose of this whole program is to, is to kind of open your eyes to some other ways of doing things. Lots to cover today. So we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get moving because I, because I, I, I've got some, some, some really great information I'm going to share with you. Uh, I call it secrets of recruitment. Um, one of the things I want you to do is, uh, I'm going to send you actually to my website here in just um, and, and a bit when we're all done because I want you to check some things out there. But I want you to notice this. We're going to be talking about recruitment today, but actually we're going to start off by defining your organization. Then we're going to talk about promoting your organization. So we're talking about recruitment, but we haven't even gotten to recruitment yet. And then the third item on the list will be actual recruitment. And then, of course, the fourth will be retention because once you report, re recruit all these new members, you got to keep them. you got to keep them involved. So as a, as a leader, a current leader, or a future leader, you need to know how to increase your numbers within your club or organization. But also, and I think equally as important, you need to understand what to look for in a club or organization that's recruiting you or that you want to join. So be aware of, be aware of these things. It's sort of like me explaining to you that surgeons need to remove all of the sponges and tools when they finish surgery before they sew you back up. You know, well, you're not a surgeon, but if you ever go in for surgery, you might want to ask the surgeon, do you have a protocol for removing sponges and sutures before you stitch me back together just to make sure they get it? Because this is a, this is a sort of the thing you need to be aware of what's going on behind the curtain. So I'm going to share with you some things that, that, that will deal with that. This is my own website here, delsugs.com. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I don't have any advertising. I don't get a penny per click. There's nothing going on there hidden that you need to be, to be, to be worried about. But if you go to delsugs.com, you can click on a link on the top menu bar or the bottom menu bar that says resources. If you go to the end resources page, it'll, it'll take you to a page that has about 80 different articles I've written on leadership skills, on higher education topics, on promotion and, and uh, marketing of your events on campus, all the information you need to really do a good job as, as, a, as a campus leader, it's all there for you. And I'll tease you with this because I love this. About two thirds of the way down the page, I've got a set of downloadable PowerPoint templates for television game shows. So you can download these, you can unpack them, you can create your own version of Jeopardy or Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh, there's about a half dozen of those or, or more that, they're, that you're welcome to use. And it's really, they're, they're really handy, they're really fun. Some of them even have the theme use thongs and stuff. So like when you, if you're in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and you go to the next level, it goes bum bum bum, it actually plays the music for you when you click from one to the other. You can put them up on your screen, show them on a PowerPoint, and, and it's really, really fun. But let me encourage you as a leader to take it a step further. So, you know, when you get new members within your organization, especially when you get new leaders, you have to train them about the organization, your policies, procedures, your traditions, and things. How about if you created a Jeopardy game to teach your new members about your organization? It'd be like, Oh, I'll take facilities for 100. The answer is Bob Smith. Oh, oh, who do I contact to reserve a room in the student center? 
See, something like that is a lot more fun than just having to read a, a manual on policies and procedures. So be, again, be creative. Take advantage of these, um, uh, these, these game templates. I've got them there for you. So that, that's why it's there. Well, I think you know why recruitment is important. You've got to maintain your leadership. That's, I mean, your membership. You've got to keep your numbers up to make things happen. You've also got to keep your organization alive. How many members do you have to have to have a legitimate club or organization on your campus? Do you know? Hold up your fingers. Is it three, five? Because you got to have five members to have a legitimate club on your campus. So you got to keep those numbers up. You might think that's, well, that'll be easy, but it always seems easy when somebody else is doing it, you know. As I always put it, everybody else's job looks easier. Yeah. So be aware of that because you've got to keep your organization alive. And also, and most importantly, your membership then supplies the labor to reach your organization's goals. And goals are vitally important to what you're doing. We're going to spend some time talking about that also. And these guys figured it out a long time ago. You can do anything you set your mind to when you have vision, determination, and an endless supply of expendable labor. If you've never heard of this company, despair.com out of Austin, Texas, I love their work. They make, um, they make parodies of uh, motivational programs and materials. Uh, and it's, it, they're really hilarious because you've all seen these things before. They have the famous poster of the Eagle in flight and the banner headline says leaders. And in small print, it says leaders are like Eagles. We don't have either of those around here. So it's all about making fun of these things. And, and I love this. And, the, and obviously I'm not expecting you to or encouraging you to work your members like they were slaves building the pyramids, you know, but the fact of the matter is you do have to have enough people to make things happen with your organization. So that's why that's important. So again, we want to start off by defining your organization. And this is really, really important. It's a first step in recruiting because nobody wants to join the organization that doesn't know what it is. So some, some things you have to do to, to start with. The first is your mission statement. Now, every organization has to have a mission statement in order to form. You know, if you, when you felt your official paperwork, you've got to submit your mission statement. It's your, it's your purpose. But here's the thing. I want you to think about contemporary mission statements. Traditional mission statements explain what an organization does, what it does. But contemporary mission statements talk about why an organization does what it does, okay? That's the difference. So think about why your organization does the things that it does and move forward from that way. A mission statement is basically a succinct summary of your organization's purpose, what you're doing there. And one of the best ways to find that purpose is to use a process that's called the five whys. Have you ever heard of the five whys? You have, give me a wave. You haven't heard of the five whys? Oh, this is wonderful. I'm about to blow your mind. This is the coolest thing ever. The five whys, I first heard about it, I was told, is an ancient Chinese method of divining the, the source, the truth, the core of the, of the matter. When I began to research and study it, it turns out it was actually invented in 1950 by Dr. Toyota. So it's not ancient nor Chinese, but the fact of the matter is it still works. So the five whys works just like this. You ask the question why five times. And each time you get an answer, then you ask the question, why, again. And the idea is you get to the real purpose, the real reason, the real deep reason for the existence of, 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 of the issue, the problem, the concern, or your organization. I'll give you a quick example. My car won't start. Why? Because the battery's dead. Why? Because the alternator belt is broken. Why? Because I haven't been getting my car serviced. Why? Because I just moved to New Albany and I haven't developed a network enough to ask people where to take my car to get it fixed. So see, the real reason my car won't start is not because the battery's dead. That's the obvious reason. The real reason is I haven't extended my social network since I moved to town. So this is the way this thing works. I'll give you another quick example. This is, um, I did, uh, I did a, a a mission statement workshop at Houston Community College. They brought me in to help the student government rewrite their mission statement. And so I, be, I, I began without telling them we did the five whys. I didn't explain to them. I just said, why does student government exist on your campus? And the unanimous, the unanimous voice was to be the voice of the students. And so I said, well, why is that important? Well, because the administration needs to know what the students think about issues that they're concerned with. 
Great, we talked about that for a while. Now, why does the administration need to know? Because the students are the heart and soul of, of the school. That's why we're here. That's why the, the that's why the institution exists is to is to deal with our students. Great. And why is that important? Because students need to go through school and and finish their degrees and graduate and go out into the world. And the fifth line was, well, why is that important? And so because they've got to be productive citizens. They've got to go out there and make a change and have an impact on, on the world and be successful. And so I was like, okay, so we have just done the five whys and determined that you thought the reason for student government existing was to be the voice of the students, but the actual reason why it exists is to create productive and successful citizens. See, that's a whole different mindset. It's a different way of looking at things. So you've got to have a good mission statement and understanding of your mission statement, what it is and what's going on so that so that you can understand why your organization exists. First step in defining your organization. The next step, and we'll move through a little quicker with this one, is the elevator speech. You've probably heard this before, the elevator speech or elevator pitch, uh, pitch sometimes it's called. It's about 20 to 25 seconds long, and this is a succinct summary of yourself and your organization. It's called the elevator pitch because this is the way it works. If somebody gets on the elevator and they look at your shirt and they go, Indiana University Southeast, What's that all about? And the doors on the elevator close. You've got about 20 to 25 seconds before you get the next floor and the doors open and they get out the elevator. How can you explain yourself, your organization to that, to that person in 20 to 25 seconds and make it intriguing and informative? It's a clear description of your organization. And what I would suggest that you do is practice it yourself and then when you get back to your club or organization that you actually have a quick, a quick lesson in this and have everybody go around the room, create their elevator speech or their elevator pitch and then practice doing that. Because this is a really important way of summarizing who you are and what you do and sharing it with the world. Because if you're gonna be recruiting people, you're gonna constantly be doing uh, you know, an explanation of, of, of what you do. Yes, great, great point there, Seth. Um, Esther did do an elevator pitch. She did an elevator speech introducing uh, her, her organization. That's when we got here early, so she said so she could do that. Perfect, perfect example. How about your goals? Does your organization have goals? You better have goals because that's what, you know, that's what organizations exist is to do something. But most importantly, why should your potential members care about your goals? Why should they care? Uh, is it something that, that is important to them? something they should be involved with, something they should know, what will they gain from being a part of that? And this is vitally important too, because uh, membership within your organization is, um, should result in some transformative experiences for your students that are there. And the final thing is this, what I call the power of BHAGs. Are you familiar with BHAGs? Big, hairy, audacious goals? Okay, BHAGs are huge goals. And the thing about BHAGs is that they are inspirational, okay? So here's a, a real quick example. Um, are any of you students, are any of you taking organic chemistry this semester? One? Okay. I am, yeah. Okay, well, well, we'll pray for you, okay? Yeah, it's like the hardest class you ever take. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's the hardest class you'll ever take. So here's the thing. If you're taking organic chemistry this semester and your goal is to just pass it, I just want to get through it. That's all. It's not going to get you out of bed at 6 a.m. to hit the books and maybe make, before you go to class at 8 o'clock, do that three days a week and do the lab work and all that. Is that going to really inspire you and move you? Probably not. Yeah. But now, how about if you had a BHAG? What if your BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal is to be the world's greatest heart surgeon? Maybe you lost a family member to heart disease or a friend, and you thought, you know, if I could be the world's greatest heart surgeon, maybe I could save somebody else from losing their family member to heart disease. And, you know, to be a great, great cardiac surgeon, you've got to get through med school. And to get into med school, you got to get through pre-med. And to get th through pre-med, you've got to get through organic chemistry. Yeah. So with that in mind, is that going to get you out of bed at 6 a.m. to hit the books? Yeah, that's the kind of thing. That's the kind of huge goal that's going to motivate you and get you moving. So again, I call them, I call them BHAGs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to share with you a BHAG. We had a little bit of a, a, little bit of a, uh, 
uh, an issue with this early, but I want I want I do want to share this this with you because this is a really powerful a really powerful example. I'd, I'd like to, to to share with you. Let's see if I could share this. I think you may have seen this before. can see this sometimes it's a little jittery but this is a scene from a Sasquatch music festival out in, uh, in in Washington State and it starts out with one guy who has a BHAG the guy without a shirt on there had this goal he said he wanted people to dance at this at this festival so being the leader that he is and the dreamer he is he got up and started dancing and lo and behold one guy came down and joined him and started dancing with him so you're thinking, well, pretty ambitious goal to think you could get people to dance at a music festival. They're all sitting around and watching. But he's dancing, his friend comes down, and then look, a third guy comes down and joins him and starts to dance with him too. He, his friend gets so excited he rolls down the hill, but he gets back up and comes back up. So don't worry, he's, he's okay, he's safe. So here they are. Now you got three guys dancing here and we have the video of this because the woman watching this from the other side of the field said, nobody's ever gonna get up and dance. This guy looks like a fool. She grabbed her iPhone and started recording it. And now suddenly people are coming in to dance. You'll hear screaming periodically. That's the woman holding the iPhone shooting this because she got so excited seeing what was going on. You can see people are streaming in now to join this. One guy with a BHAG, a big hairy audacious goal that people should be dancing at this festival. And suddenly people start showing up to dance. One leader setting an example with a huge goal. He said, you know what, we can do this. We can make this work. And next thing you know, people are coming from all over. Now a guy is about to run by in a red Speedo with an umbrella hat. I'm sharing that with you because I want you to understand what it is when you see it, otherwise you wouldn't recognize it. All right, here he comes. There he is, red speedo guy. Yeah. So people are coming in from all over. And it's hard to realize when you look at this video that this started with one guy, one guy who got up dancing. Now the band is finished. People are still running in to be a part of this. It's still exciting. People are still there. Now listen really closely. I know the audio was probably choppy. Could you hear what she said? She said, how did he do that? How did he do that? How did he do that? He had a BHAG. He had that goal, that big, hairy, audacious goal, and he made it happen. So that's why BHAGs are important. That's why BHAGs are important. They have that power of inspiration. You can make anything happen if you have that BHAG and you have that working for you. It's really huge. It's really so huge. So develop a BHAG for yourself and for your organization because you want to be able to just to, to have a goal for, uh, for your potential members and move forward there. So those are the two most important things right there I wanted to share with you about, uh, uh, about defining your organization and what it is. Now, I want to talk to you real quickly about promoting your organization, because see, here's the point. Nobody wants to join a club they've never heard of. So you got to have some sort of a, uh, some sort of a, a public image before you even start looking for members. So that's why this is important. There was an old marketing campaign done by American Express called Membership Has Its Privileges. Because interestingly enough, although we think of MasterCard and Visa and American Express and Discover as all being the same thing, they're not. Because MasterCard, Visa, and Discover, you are a customer. But with American Express, you're a member. Is there a real difference? In the way you feel, maybe. 
And so because of that, they say membership has its privileges because American Express, they, what they really sell is not just the ability to use their card, but the ability to get other benefits from, from being a member, a member of American Express. And so think about what your students get from being a member of your club or organization. As a potential member, think about what you will get from that organization if you are a member of that. Use that to create a slogan or a logo or something that, that can drive things forward and make it all happen there. Then you need to promote your organization. Understand that promotion is just free advertising. It's marketing that you do not pay for. So take advantage of that. Um, it, you know, involves uh, everything from, from uh, using your social networks properly, you know, using the technology and get stuff out there. Are you familiar with, with a, a site called Hootsuite.com? I want you to check out Hootsuite.com because I love this site. Hootsuite is what's called a social network conglomerator or aggregator. And so what it does is you open an account with a free account with Hootsuite, and you can link up to three of your social media accounts to that same account. That means you can update all of those other ones just by going to Hootsuite, which is great because that means you don't have to log on to uh, to Instagram and you know, and then log on to Facebook and then log on to Twitter to, to update all of those things. You can just do it all at Hootsuite.com. But here's the thing I love about it: you can actually schedule your updates in advance. So you don't have to log on. You have to remember, oh, I need to remember to log on at 3 o'clock this afternoon and post that the tickets go on sale for the show tonight. You don't have to do that. You can post that on Hootsuite, and then at 3 o'clock, your phone will chime. You pick up your phone and go, oh, look what I just had to say. I just, you know, and, and it'll jog everybody's memory and get the word out that tickets are on sale. So understand that you take advantage of the, of the technology that's here. You can and use your Snapchat, your Instagram, your Twitter feed, all of this to promote your programs and your events and, and, and your club and your organization to get the word out on people. But don't overlook low technology too. We get so caught up in the whole in the whole interaction of, of social media. You know, we want to find that one post that we can, we can put out there, that one website we can go to and list something that will just bring everybody to the, to the door. And it doesn't happen that way. One of your most important and useful means of promoting your club or organization is, is through what we call face-to-face -face interactions. It's, it's sometimes called word of mouth, where somebody tells you something about a club or organization. And this is really, really powerful because word of mouth or face-to-face -face interactions have an implied endorsement. See, here's the thing. If I tell you that my club is the coolest club you've ever heard of, then that's one thing. But if I tell you that Cole told me the club is the coolest club they've ever heard of, then you're going to go, well, you know what? Cole said that. That's a, you know, Cole must really be thinking that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. So it's all a matter of not just putting up a post of this as we are the best, is having your members go around saying, I don't know if we're the best, but I think we are. And having that implied endorsement from coming from them personally. That's why it's so powerful there. Don't forget your elevator speech and your elevator pitch and how you can utilize that to make things happen. The University of Tennessee in Knoxville did a survey of their, all their programs or events about four years ago, three years ago now. And they asked everybody who came to a program or event, how did you learn about this program? Because they spent a lot of, a lot of their time and energy on um, Instagram, they have a whole Snapchat marketing program that they do. They're on Twitter. Uh, they're always pushing things through the social social media. Well, they went through their surveys at the end of the year, and it turns out that 67% of people that came to their programs or events learned about them through a flyer or a poster. So once you get back on campus, remember how powerful those things can be. Those posters and flyers really, really are effective at getting the word out and make a huge difference. So do that. Use, utilize the low tech stuff too. Utilize your campus newspaper, whether it's uh, published or online, make sure that you, you, you get them all the information and also let them know about the, all the accomplishments and awards that your organization does because you're doing important stuff. You know, you're at, a, you're at a, this, this special workshop right now just to learn about recruitment. You should send out a press release tomorrow that you were here. You know, you went, you went to a special class presented by Dell Suggs, one of the foremost speakers in the college market. You know, I'm not a big deal. But they don't know I'm not a big deal. So let's, you know, let's make it sound like it's important and make that happen. So this is, this is a, again, it adds credibility to your, to your organization and to what you're doing. So make sure that you, you promote your, your accomplishments and awards. These are really important. It's not bragging if you really did it, okay? That's what I always say. So make sure that your people know about the great things that your organization is doing and move forward there. Okay, so we've talked already about 
define your organization. We've talked about promoting your organization. Now it's time to actually get down to the nitty gritty of recruiting for your organization. And it starts off one way and one way only. You gotta be enthusiastic, okay? You gotta be enthusiastic about your club or organization. Nobody wants to join a, a, you know, a club or organization that's being managed by Eeyore. Remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? Oh, well, I guess it's a good club. I don't know, yeah, maybe. Yeah, you gotta be excited. You gotta be enthusiastic. You got to be pumped up and let people know how wonderful and exciting and these great BHAGs that your organization has. It's great things that you're doing and all the fun you're having and the, and the great stuff that you've got going on. But you're starting through recruitment with your friends and your FOFs. FOFs are, you probably know this, friends of friends. See, this is your real live social network. These are the people that you normally would, would, would be dealing with and chatting with. So make sure that you start off with these folks to, 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 you know, initially when you start to, to do, your, do your recruitment and move forward there because it's really vital that you start off with these folks because these are the folks that know you. These are the people that trust you. And so you want to make sure that you're able to, to work with them and reach out to them to make things happen. Use your technology. Do searches on Instagram. It's find potential new people that, that might want to be a part of your organization and, and see what they're doing and, and uh, the things that, that, that they're interested in that you can then incorporate in what you're doing. And then your involvement fair. Now, I know you've got involvement fairs coming up. You've got them doing them virtually online. You're going to streaming, um, streaming later. Your involvement fair is a great opportunity for you to actually um, uh, you know, talk to your students and, and get them involved with what you're doing. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of things you can do with your involvement fair that are physical. So for this fall, you may not be able to, to, to utilize these, but it's important that, to understand that you can utilize virtual versions of this. So to make your involvement fair happen, first of all, you've got to have information. So you've got to have materials available online, whether it's PDFs, whether it's a website, whether it's a, a Facebook page about your club or organization, that when your members, when your potential members attend the um, the involvement fair, they can find out about your club or organization. They can have to go there and get some, 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 some information, do a little more research and learn more about what you're doing and how to make um, how the, the, uh, the great things that you're doing and, and, the, and the great BHAGs and the uh, goals you set for yourself, plus all the advantages that you get from being a, becoming a member of this, of this organization. Have that there. Staff your table. Now, if you have a, a real physical, a real physical, uh, you know, in, involvement fair than it's simple to do. Online, this means you need to have somebody watching the, uh, your, your Facebook page. So when people ask questions and post things, you can respond to them immediately. Have, uh, you know, have students who can, can, can be there for your Instagram feeds. And when people post things that you can back, get back to them and respond very promptly and, and, and go out there. Uh, have a sign-up sheet or a table so that if people need more information, would like to, do, to talk to somebody directly, make it simple for them to actually get up with you. This is really, really important, and it's often overlooked. Invite potential new members to attend your next meeting. You know, a lot of times we get so excited about telling people about our club or organization, we forget, forget that even very simple thing about, about just, why don't you come to a meeting and see if it works for you? So reach out to them and let them know that they're invited to attend your next meeting and move forward there. And then last, follow up with a phone call or a text. Reach out to them and let them know that you really are interested and intrigued with them and you think that they would make a great addition to your club or organization. And if a club or organization doesn't follow up with you when you've shown interest, understand they're dropping the ball because you may not be interested in, in, in joining a club or organization if folks don't follow up with you. And, and, uh, and let you know that they really do want you to come on board because you folks are special. And that's why, I mean, you're, 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 you're something. So everyone should be interested in getting you to, to serve as a member, uh, you know, a member of their club or organization. So understand that. I want you to improve your recruitment by going after first year students. Yeah, this is really, really, really works well. We used to joke uh, when I was, when I was uh, at, at Florida State in school there, we'd go to all the orientation programs. Uh, and on behalf of the Campus Activity Board, we would announce the schedule for the upcoming programs and events. And we would say attendance is mandatory for all freshmen. And so they would come to the first week worth of events and then they would realize they didn't have to be there. It wasn't actually mandatory. But by then, they had already gotten in the habit of being there. 
And so they came, they continued to come to programs or events rather than finding out about them after the fact. So I think it's really powerful to, uh, to reach out to first year students. But here's the most important reason. And I love this. They're energetic, but they're hesitant. First year students, they wanna get engaged on campus, but they don't really know how. If they're just hitting campus for the first time, they don't know how to get involved. You're their key to campus involvement because they're excited about being there. They're looking forward and they're just find, trying to find a way to connect. So you be their connection. You be the means of them getting involved and becoming a part of your, of your, campus, uh, your campus life and getting them engaged because here's what we know. Engagement enhances education. Think about that. Engagement enhances education. Now, IU Southeast has a branch campus up in Bloomington, you've probably heard of. Um, and they, they have a program there that's called the National Survey on Student Engagement. And Nessie has gone on for years and years, about 35 years, I think they have more of the material there that they've been And what they do is they survey students on, on the set number of college campuses across the country thousands and thousands, and they, they, uh, they, they compile the data. And what they've discovered is that students who are involved on campus, who are members of clubs and organizations, who are involved in student activities, who go to programs or events, are my, more likely to stay in school, they're more likely to get better grades, and most importantly, they're more likely to graduate. See, we don't think about that. And a lot of times you'll meet students who are new to campuses and you'll invite them to become involved in an organization and they go, no, 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 I'm not gonna be doing all that fun stuff. I'm gonna be hitting the books. What they need to know is that being involved in those clubs and organization is as important to their development as students. In the area of student development, um, that they all need to, they need to be aware that this is what it really keeps them involved and in school and makes things happen. Engagement enhances education. I'm going to give you some anec a little anecdotal story to, to, to maybe help you understand this. Do you recognize uh, this, this TV show? This show was on, a, uh, on the air over about 80 different countries uh, in, uh, in the 90s. It was a huge show. Um, especially uh, kids watched this show. It was a big, a big hit. It's still streaming online today. You can actually watch it every Sunday morning. I tune in some Sunday mornings and watch it on, on the MeTV network sometimes, just, just to see it. Okay, the guy in the top there is named Dennis Haskins. And he was the principal, principal building in this TV call, show called Saved by the Bell, which is just about to be, uh, to be, to be, to be redone. It's about to, to come back on one of the streaming channels. So that's, that's my buddy Dennis right there. So Dennis, um, it's, a, it's an old friend of mine. We've, we, we go way, way back. In fact, here's a, here's a picture of us at a conference um, from about six or seven years ago um, that we were, we were both attending. But we were really good friends. We, we, um, in fact, he actually wrote the foreword to my book, Truly Leading Lessons in Leadership. And here's a cool story about, about Dennis. Okay, Dennis went to college at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. And when he was a senior in college, he was the concerts chair. He was in charge of booking all the concerts that came to the University of Tennessee Chattanooga. He loved the music business. What he wanted to do was have a career in the music business. But he, in order to do that, he had to be his service year as the uh, concerts chair there on campus. And he told me, and this is honestly what he told me, he said, the only reason I went to class and did my homework was so I could get that 2.5 grade point average so I could stay on the program board because I knew if I didn't go to class and I didn't at least get those minimum grades, they would kick me off the program board. And this is what I wanted to do. So Dennis graduated from University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. He, he started the music business. He went on the road. He was the road manager and tour manager for the Allman Brothers, uh, Greg Allman and, and, uh, and Dickie Betts and some, some various other groups and organizations. And then one day he showed up at an audition um, for a television show called In the Heat of the Night. He ended up getting a role on that. And then he ended up being uh, in another program called the Dukes of Hazard. And then he moved to LA and started doing a lot of, a lot of films and motion pictures. And he got this, this, what ended up to be a life changing role for him when he got picked to, to serve as principal building in Saved by the Bell. But you've probably seen him in a lot of other films that you didn't even realize. So things like um, A Million Ways to Die in the Old West. He was in the last season um, finale of Mad Men. Uh, he pops up all the time. I'll just be watching TV and he will just pop up, you know, in a, playing a character role. So he's a, uh, he's a great guy. But I always remember that story because the only reason he graduated and got his degree was 
was so he could stay involved. So it's anecdotal, obviously, but the fact of the matter is it's true. The more involved and engaged you are on campus, the more likely you are to graduate and move forward. So get your students involved, especially these first year students. Go after them, get them involved. And if they're hesitant, understand they're looking for a way to engage. They're looking for a way to connect with the campus. So reach out and, and, and help them. You're, you be the conduit for them to get involved on campus. And they will thank you for that. They will thank you for that um, as their grades come up. As they, they stay in school, they find a way to, to, to graduate and move through. So you have such a successful involvement fair. You have all of these new members. They show up at your first Zoom meeting afterwards because you invited them. You send them the invite because you got that information. They all show up at your, at your first meeting after the involvement fair. Now what do you do? Because you know if you've ever been to a meeting and you didn't say or do anything that entire meeting, you know, you felt like you weren't a part of anything. So here's the thing, keep these new members by first of all, recognizing and acknowledging them. You know, if, if you're chairing a meeting, um, you should recognize all the new members that are there, make sure that you introduce them to the, to the old members, the senior members who are there, and that uh, everybody feels like they're accepted, that they're, they're um, being recognized and that they're important. Create a ceremony or a ritual for your members. Uh, this is hard to do virtually, but it's something you can do uh, in, in the real world, which makes things important. Ritual and ceremony is really, really important with clubs and organizations. It adds gravity and importance to what, to what you do. Um, don't make it too easy to become a member of your club or organization. You know, sometimes we do that. Sometimes we say, oh, just show up. We need members. Yeah, just show up and uh, yeah, you'll be a member. Maybe not. Maybe you do this. Maybe when they first show up, they are a provisional member, but they don't become a full member until they've been to three meetings and worked on one of your programs, your events or activities. Then that fourth meeting after that, that event they've worked on and the other three meetings I've been to, that's when they get their pin. That's when they get their official shirt. That's when something happens that lets them, lets them know that they have now earned membership within your organization. That's when you all come together and you prick your fingers and you put them all together and no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. That would be bad. That'd be bad. But you all feel like then you're part of something bigger, something, something important, something important. So make sure you create ritual and ceremony. Think about how you can, can create um, a ceremony that welcomes and shows um, that you're glad to have these members involved. Now I'm not talking about hazing, but I am talking about more of a, a facilitated bonding. Something to do to make your, your new members feel like they're welcome and they're, um, that they're important. And it's, and it's a big deal to become a member of your organization. Maybe they get a sash, you know, maybe they get a pin, they get their special shirt. They learn the secret handshake, you know, they learn the gang sign. Yeah. Something important. Yeah. You're laughing. I know. Cause you're looking at me, you're going, what's this guy know about gang signs? Let me tell you when I was in high school, I was in a member of one of the most, widely known gangs in this country, the future farmers of America. And when we were on campus, if you saw a stranger across campus and you want to know if they were a member of, of, of the future farmers of America, you gave them the gang sign. If they gave it back, you knew they were a member. You probably know the gang sign, right? For the, for the future farmers of America. F F A. Yeah. Saying if you got it back, then you knew they were cool. Yeah. So <laughs> there you go. So, you, you know, again, I'm sort of making fun of this, but I'm really not because criminal gangs have colors and gang signs because it increases retention because it makes people feel special and important. So if you want people to feel special and important because they're a member of your organization, come up with ways to, that, that do that. Create these rituals and these ceremonies and these colors and, and symbols and things that, 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 that say that you're, you're different, you're special, your organization is unique and important. It plays a huge role. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hook them horns, there you go. That's it, that's it. At Florida State, it's the tomahawk chop, you know. Every, every school has, has a symbol like that. So uh, I, was, I was just at, at um, University of Akron uh, last week. And there is, is um, that's it. It's the Z because they're the zips. 
And so this is what their students do. Yeah. So, you know, come up with, with, with a sign for your organization that, that you could share. It pays huge dividends. It pays huge dividends because, again, it makes people feel special like they're involved. You know. Next, get your new members involved. If you're involved with your organization right now, you should have a list of upcoming projects and events and programs that you need help with. And so when you get your new members, give them some, some responsibility. Give them something to do. Give them, get them involved at their very first meeting. And this is important. Get them involved at their very first meeting. If you've ever been to a meeting, you sat in the back of the room, you didn't say anything for the whole meeting. When it was over, you didn't feel very well connected. But the next time you have a meeting and you have those new members there, call them out. Call them out. Michelle, I know this is your first time here. We've just met. But I've got a big event coming up next Saturday. Uh, could you... If I sent you a Facebook flyer, could you forward that out to a, like 20 of your closest friends and just let them know about it? You could do that, right? Yeah, okay, Michelle just agreed to do that. So I just gave her a, a, an assignment, a, a responsibility to do. Now, here is the psychology behind this. Studies have been done that show that when you first meet somebody, if you ask them to do you a small favor, they immediately like you better. Isn't that amazing? And we don't think about it, but we do it all the time. Have you ever, you remember being like in the library and studying and there's somebody sitting across the table from you, you don't even know. And they look at you and they go, I'm going to run to the restroom. Will you watch my books? And you go, sure, go on. Yeah. And you watch their books. What you didn't realize is you now like that person. You maybe didn't like them before, but you like them now because they ask you to do them a favor and you agreed. So, Get your new members involved. Give them something to do. Ask them to do your organization a favor. They will like you better. This is how this works. It's amazing. It's amazing. It seems sort of counterintuitive because you think, um, why would I like somebody who asked me to do them a favor? Well, it can't be a big favor. You can't say, Cole, nice to meet you, buddy. Can I borrow your car? Okay, that's not going to work. Okay, that's not going to work. But I could say, Cole, I'm so glad you're at today's meeting. If I forwarded you a, a Facebook flyer, could you share this with, 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 with 20 of your friends on Instagram? You know, would, you, uh, would you go back to our Instagram account and like and, uh, and, and everything that, that we've done up to this point? If I sent you a tweet, would you re retweet it? Yeah. So these are ways that, you, that, you, that you, you, can, you can do this. And simply by asking somebody to help, giving them a duty, a responsibility, you have made them like your club or organization better. Yeah. So take advantage of the psychology. You know, use, use what you know now and make this happen. Reach out and give them something to do. And I'll kind of move towards the, the, the conclusion here so we'll have a little bit of time to chat. But make sure that you do things, real basic things, like having regularly scheduled meetings. You know, you can create a, a Zoom meeting for your club or organization or on, on Google Meets. You can do the same thing. Google Meets is awesome because... Just about everybody has a, has a Gmail account. So if people aren't comfortable with Zoom, although just about everybody is now, um, you could always have your meetings on Google Meets because that, that's really, really simple. And all you need for that is simply to have a, a, a Google account, a Gmail account or Google account. And practically everybody has one of those these days. But have your regular scheduled meetings. In fact, when you set up your meetings, you should actually do them, the, the, your, your virtual meetings, as a recurring meeting so that everybody, everybody can do that. And everybody knows um, what, you know, when the meeting is, what's scheduled, and, uh, and, and what takes place there. So make sure that you move forward there. Actively pursue the goals that you set for yourself and for your organization. Get people involved to make those things happen. Nobody wants to, to join a club or organization to go to meetings, okay? We, we have enough meetings. You know, we don't want to just go to meetings. We want to do stuff, you know. We want to learn stuff. We want to experience things, you know, and so have your, have your meetings, but make sure that you, you're, you actually use those uh, as a means of pursuing your goals. Use those to, to, to bring your members in, to get them organized, to create those sense of duties and promote your upcoming events and programs and moving forward there. Stay in touch with all of your members. This is really, really important. Members can feel like they're, they're being overlooked if you don't reach out to them. So make sure you have those, um, uh, those text lists that you can reach out to text to everyone. You can create a, you know, a, you can create a group on, um, on Twitter. Um, and this is really cool. A lot of folks don't know about this, uh, but, uh, you know, we don't use Facebook much anymore, but the, you can actually go to Facebook and create a secret 
group on Facebook. That nobody else can see or nobody knows about except the members. So it's a great way for you to connect your club or organization up through a secret Facebook group that nobody else can see. It makes it easy for you then you to, to stay in touch that way and kind of, kind of stay plugged in. But there are all sorts of ways you, you, can, you can do this, but you've got to stay in communication with each other. You know, create your own, your own um, uh, texting network so you can stay in touch that way so you're, so you're constantly being focused. But it's important that you communicate with everybody. Stay positive, okay? You gotta be positive about what you're doing in your organization. Again, nobody wants to be hanging around a bunch of groomy, groom, uh, gloomy gusses, okay? So make sure that, that, you're, that you're, uh, you're, you're always looking at the upside of what you're doing, what you've got planned, what's coming down the pike. And then the last is this, you gotta have fun, you know? It's gotta be fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. That's just the basics right there. So when you look at your club or organization, and you begin to recreate it, restructure it, you define your organization, you're finding ways to promote your organization to get the word out, you're recruiting those new members and bringing them in, you're practicing positive means of retaining those new members, make sure that you're having fun. People like to be around fun, people like to hang around with other, other people that are having a good time, and it just makes everything, everything upbeat. You know, attitude is everything. In fact, here is your, um, Here's your, your, uh, an, an update you can share this afternoon, either to, uh, to Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat this out to your, to, your, to, your, to your friends or put it on Facebook. B positive is not just a blood type. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so important. You've got to be positive about, about what you're doing and about your organization because that's what makes people, makes people uh, join. That's what keeps people coming back and being a part of what's going on. So be positive and have fun with it all. Any questions, you can, uh, we can unmute your mic and you can ask, ask a question. Um, you can post it on chat if you, if you feel better doing that. But any questions or any issues or concerns you're having with your own clubs or organizations or your own recruitment process or the things going on that you're, uh, that you're concerned with, you'd like to know more about or maybe have some, a little bit of insight? You know, it's it's tough. We've never had to deal with this before. We've got a, a we've got a, a this fall, this virtual fall that we're facing. It's 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 really unique, you know. And it's and it's um, as much of a struggle as it is. We've got to maintain a good attitude about it, you know. This, you know, we're a, I always think whenever I'm in a bad situation, I think this is going to make a great story one day. You know, and I keep thinking that, you know, in a few years, we're all going to have these great quarantine stories you're going to be sharing and people are going to go, wow, yeah, I've heard about that. I wasn't there then, but I remember that reading about there was, there was some kind of bug and you guys were locked down. Yeah, yeah. And it'll be, it'll be a great story. It'll be, a, you'll have a lot of great stories. Um, when I was just a, a young child, I remember the oldest relatives in my family would tell stories about the, uh, the flu pandemic of, uh, of, of 1918. And I have a lot of relatives who, who died in the, during that flu pandemic. But they used to tell these stories, and it made no sense at all to me, the stories they were telling me. It makes a lot of sense to me now. You know, Talked about how my, my great-grandfather would chop wood and put on the um, front porches of his neighbors because his neighbors were sick. But he wouldn't carry it inside because he didn't want to get sick by carrying it inside. So he'd chop wood and deliver it and leave it on, the, on their front porch, for, front porch for him, feed their animals in the fields because they, uh, they were too sick to go out and do that. Or when he would walk to town, to, uh, he would walk through the woods to go to town so he wouldn't have to pass anybody on the road. That's the ultimate social distancing right there. They didn't have that term then, but that's exactly what he was doing. So we're all going to have these great quarantine stories. That's, that, you know, that's, that's, that's what we do. Okay, question, when you see your audience losing interest, how do you get them back on track? You've got to, you know, you just got to find a way to keep people tuned in, keep them focused. You can tell, tell a story, you can bring a personal experience out, but you'll find that most people that are, that are involved, they're there for a reason because they care about things, you know, and, and so they, they're, they care about what you're, what, you're, what you're dealing with. And of all the different programs I do and all the programs I've done, it's, you know, all, all, over, the, uh, all over the country, all sorts, you know, both in, both in person and uh, these virtual programs, you know, there are always some people that just tune out, but most of the time people are going to stay focused and going to stay involved. Um, I'll tell you one real quick, little, quick little trick that I was taught a long time ago. 
And that is this, you start off personal and you end up universal. So you start off your programs and your events by telling a personal story that kind of brings people in and gets people involved. We did that with the, uh, the questions we asked you earlier. And then you end up on a broader, in a broader place where, you know, you're looking at more universal um, uh, uh, topics and, and areas and, and factors that are involved there. Shy students, how do you recruit a shy student? That's a, you know, shy students are not always shy. You know, sometimes they're distracted. Sometimes they don't realize that they're, uh, that they're not being as focused and as outgoing as, as other people are. Um, but really, it, it, it takes letting people know that you're, in, that you're interested in them. Recruiting students to join your club or organization means you've got to actually go out and, 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 and talk to those students. And you've got, to, you've got to actually make contact with them. You got to send them a text. You got to send them a, an email. You got to you got to send them a, a direct message. You got to reach out and let them know. And yeah, they might be shy. They might not. You know, they might take them a while to get back to you. But you've got to really go out of your way to make them make them feel like like they're important. Now, no stalking. Okay, you know, be, be aware of that. There's a there's not even a fine line. There's a clear line. You know between letting people know that you're, in, that you're interested in, in having them being of your, a member of your club or organization and, and, uh, and stalking them. So you want to avoid that. Any, uh, any indication that might, you might be going too far. But again, if you follow the kind of steps that I've laid out for you, if you figure out what your organization is, create that mission statement so that, you, so that you're well-defined, you have a, a purpose for your organization existing, then letting people know what it is that you're doing and, and letting people know all the fun you're having and that you are the great, you know, you're, it, that's why clubs and organizations like to wear their shirts because they want people to know, hey, they're a member of our club or organization, you know? And so you got to have the shirts that say chess club, you know, the IU chess club, here we are, you know, no, we're not the chess club. We are the chess masters, you know, make it fancy, make it attractive, you know, and reach out to those shy chess players, you know, and get them involved with what's going on. You know, and, and, and help your members understand, again, what they gain from being a member of your organization. Again, we, like we said before, people don't join a club or organization to go to meetings. You know, and so one of the things that you learn um, as, as a leader of an organization is you've got to make things happen for your members. So if you had a chess club, you'd want to not just have meetings, you want to have competitions. You want to have speakers come in that could teach them about how to be, do a better job as a speaker. Uh, I mean, as a uh, as a chess player, you know, teach them the things that they need to know to be a, to be a better chess player. Bring a speaker in to talk about uh, other competition matches and things like that. And maybe if you're a, you know, if you have a chess club, you set a BHAG to host the state tournament on your campus. You know, that's a huge goal. Will you will you see it happen? You may graduate before it actually happens. But see how inspiring that could be because that, that would inspire new members to come and want to join and be a part of what you're doing there and, and kind of plug in. Again, you know, having those BHAGs is so vitally important. But, but it's, it's, it's a struggle to, to recruit shy students because, you know, um, we have a tendency, um, some people call it lazy. It's not really lazy. It's the... Uh, it's, it's, it's basic uh, Newton's laws of, of, physics, of, of, uh, of physics, you know, an, 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 um, an item in motion tends to stay in motion, and an item that's idle tends to stay idle. So it's easier just to sit idle, idly by and watch the shy students walk away. But you've got to break that inertia, you know, and you've got to get up and after, actually go after them. You got to text them, you got to, you got to uh, uh, hit them with a, with a, with a snap. You got to reach out and, um, and, and, and pull them in and let them know that uh, what they gain from being a part of your club or your organization and move forward there. That helps Seth. You got that, that, that. Okay. Give you a little, little direction there. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I don't know how to word it though. Okay. Uh, as a president myself, uh, my, my club, is small and I would like it to be bigger, obviously. But um, uh, so after my first meeting, how do I like show the new people who have come that like I appreciate them? Like should I like shoot them an email? Like how do I make it more personal so that they come back? Yeah, you definitely want to shoot them an email, a text, you, you know, reach out to them and let them know that you appreciate them. I'm a huge believer in creative thank you gifts. I do this all the time. A lot of people love Oprah. 
Yes. Because you get a car and you get a car and you get a car. So everybody comes to your meeting and they get involved. Give them all a car. Okay. So you don't have Oprah's I don't think budget. Yeah. That of money. So this is what you do. <laughs> yeah. So this is what you do. This is what I do. Because I have leadership roles too. I'm I'm president of Florida's Big Bend Scenic Byway, which is a, a, a 220 drive mile through North Florida. It's like Florida's version of the Blue Ridge Parkway or Pacific Coast Highway. I was just named um, chairman of the Council on Culture and the Arts, which is Tallahassee, Florida's local arts agency recognized by the state of Florida. So um, I'm an, an, active, an active volunteer leader also. But I'm a firm believer in these creative thank you gifts. So this is what I do. There, there, there are these stores that every town I've ever been to has one of these stores. And I know you have them in New Albany. You may have multiple, multiple, uh, ver uh, multiple stores like this. I love these stores. My favorite store on the planet. It's called the Dollar Tree. <laughs> the Dollar Tree. Yeah. That big green sign out front, it's like, it's like a beacon to me when I see that sign. And mm -hmm. what I do is I go in the Dollar Tree and I get one of those green baskets. And I walk up and down the aisle and I look at all the products in there and I think, how can I use these to make a creative thank you gift? So I'll go over to like the, the, uh, the health and beauty section and I'll get like a bottle of aspirin and a bottle of antacids and I get a gift bag and I wrap them up and put them in. I write a thank you note that says, you took care of my heartaches and my headaches when you agreed to be chairman of homecoming. Yeah. And you, and you give them stuff like that. You go over to the, um, to the floral department and you get a bouquet of plastic flowers, you know, cheap plastic flowers. And you write a thank you note that says, these flowers are made from petrochemicals. They will last forever. That's how long I'll be grateful to you for your help with this project. You go to the candy aisle, you get a hundred grand bar and you write a thank you note that says, this is the biggest candy bar they make, but you're worth way more than a hundred grand. See, silly little things like that. You know, um, you go to the toy aisle, you buy a Hot Wheels car. They're three for a dollar. I know I buy them. And you put them in an envelope with a thank you gift, with a thank you note that says, if I had Oprah's budget, I'd give you a real car. But it doesn't mean I don't appreciate you as much as she appreciates hers. Yeah. Because we have this, uh, this whole idea that, you know, that gifts are important. Gifts aren't important. Gifts really, it's a thought that counts. And gifts really drive that thank you home. So I would encourage you to, to, uh, to find some real simple, cheap ways to let people know you appreciate them. When your members come to your, to that, to that meeting, um, that first meeting, especially you make them feel welcome, make them feel special, make them feel important. Um, you know, um, and I love this quote from Dr. Maya Angelou. She said, you know, people will forget what you said. They'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And so make those people that come to your, to, your, to your meeting, make them feel special. Make them feel important because they are special and they are important. Yeah, so reach out and, and if, it, if, it, um, if you could follow up with, with not just a, a, you know, a text or an email or, 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 or direct message, but also with a little silly, little cheap thank you gift. Thanks for coming to the meeting. Thanks for posting those you know, thanks for, thanks for reposting those 25, um, to the, 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 thanks for reposting that, 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 um, status I sent out to 25 of your friends. Thanks for sharing this, you know, with the other members and, and just something really, really, um, you know, just a really simple thing because the, um, the silly little gift really magnifies and draws attention to the fact that you, you did something nice for them. And so make sure that you, you do follow up. And I'm just a real firm believer in writing handwritten thank you notes. You know, just really, 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 really important. Especially when somebody does something special for you. I mean, it's one thing to send somebody a text and says, thanks for your help with this. But to me, a real thank you note is not THX capital U send. Okay, that's not a thank you note. You know, that's, that's, that's great. But if somebody, you know, you, if, if somebody did something simple for you, like, you pulled in, into, in, you were pull, trying to park your car and there was something in the way, they hopped out and they moved something. Well, that's fine. That's nice. But if they did something important, something special, like they came to a meeting and helped out, you might want to drop them that thank you note, a real handwritten thank you note that say, thanks for getting involved with the chess club. You know, we couldn't have these tournaments without volunteers like you, and you made a huge difference. And let people know how much, how much you appreciate. 
and this is, I, I, I know I'm pounding this to the ground. We've got a lot of, a lot, trying, to, trying to share a lot of stuff here, here with you. One of the things that's really, really important to, to, to do is when you, when you do thank people, thank them for something specifically, okay? Don't say, thank you for coming to the meeting. You know, it was great having you there and I loved having you. You know, that's, that's generic. Say, thank you for coming to the meeting. You know, that question you ask about where we could do a great car wash, that was great because you really got me started thinking when you, when you talked about that. Now that's important. See, that's personal. That's direct. So whenever you thank somebody, thank them for something specific, okay? Even if it's something tiny, something little, thank them for something specific. It's a huge, huge, powerful lesson. Um, and again, it, it, it just drives home the point that you do care about them, that you do think they're important, and it makes them feel special. And, you know, let's be honest, we all want to feel special, you know? We all want to feel like we have value, and we know that we do, but it's easy to overlook that sometimes. And so a little, uh, a little reaffirmation from somebody else never hurts. So be that reaffirmation. I hope that helps. Yeah. Oh, that helps so much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I also loved how it was like from Dollar Store because <laughs> you know that college students are broke now. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, as we always say, it's, you know, it's not the gift. It's, it's the thought that counts, you know. So you could give people anything as long as you write a nice thank you note with it, you know, and so make sure that, 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 that that's there. But, you know, it's really kind of to draw attention to the, to, the, to the thank you note and lets people know that you did, you know, put out some effort to make things, make things happen and to direct things, you know, that you, that you are aware of them, who they are, what they do and how, how things move forward there. Yeah. Well, then, thank you for... Oh, you are so welcome. Thank you, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, we have a couple more things real quick. I know, I know we're, we're, we're running over time, so I'm, I'm going to move forward here. I always like to start and end with a quote, so I love this quote. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you sow. Think about that. Robert Louis Stevenson. Yeah, I love that. Um, this is a QR code and a link. If you've got your phone, you're welcome to scan that code. This would be a, do a real quick assessment on this program. You can actually answer some questions. And um, it, 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 I'm not looking for any specific feedback. It just, I'm at, I'll ask you some questions on this about um, what I covered today. And so if you, if you answer these questions and let me know, um, it's, it, it's all anonymous, but it lets me know then if I'm doing a good job or not. So it allows me to know if I, if I, if you learned the points that I'm trying to get you to learn, you know, I don't just wing this stuff. I've got a set of, of, of learning outcomes for this program and I want to make sure that you master those learning outcomes, you know? And so, um, this helps me understand if, if, if I, uh, if I got things, things right. So, um, make sure you check this out and, and to wrap things up for me, I want to, I want to, um, I want to just reach out to you and be straight with you on this. Um, we have all suffered through this zoom meeting together. Okay. And so I want to be a resource for you. So you know how you have my contact information. You know, you can find me online. I'm all over the internet. You can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, you can email me. You have my contact information. Uh, you know where my website is. There are email links all over that. You can always reach out to me. And here's what, here's what you do. If you will reach out to me with a question, I will get back to you. I promise you that. I want to be a resource for you. This is what I do. Okay. This is my life. You know, and nothing makes me happier than getting a message from a student or a staff member or an administrator that says, you know, we're having trouble with this issue. What do you think? You got any ideas, any suggestions? Boom. It's like, yes, yeah, I do have some ideas for you. You know, at this school, they did this and this, and at this school, they did this and this. So I'm happy to share those with you and point you in the right, right, in the right direction. And if I don't know the answer, I can point you in the direction of somebody who does. But I want to be a resource for you. Do not hesitate to reach out to me with any question at all. I will not loan you money. Okay. I hear periodically from students that say, Dale, I got I'm a hundred bucks short this month, man. I got to pay the rent. I'm like, sorry, dude, I can't really help you with that. You know, but I will respond to your questions. I promise you I will do that. And then, again, nothing makes me happier than hearing from hearing from students with a question or issue or concern. And if, if I can help you in any way, I'm certainly, certainly happy to do that. And, uh, and to me, that's what it's all about. 